Um, welcome to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's 34th meeting in 2018. Could I ask everyone to make sure, he says, reaching for his mobile phone to make sure that he's done it, which he hadn't, that all your mobile phones are on silent. Uh, no apologies have been received. We are going to move on straight on to agenda item one, which is the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. This is our third evidence session on this bill uh, with enterprise and development agencies. I'd like to welcome Steve Dunlop, the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, Douglas Cowan, the Director of Strengthening Communities, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, uh, Chris Brady, the Head of Sector Development Skills and Planning Skills Development Scotland, Malcolm Roughhead, the Chief Executive of Visit Scotland, and Michael Cross, the Director of Access Skills and Outcome Agreements. Um, welcome. Those of you that have given evidence before will know that you don't need to touch your microphones. They will become live uh, when, when I bring you in. And what I would ask you... Uh, it's quite a big panel and it's quite a big committee, so it's always a question of trying to manage time. And what I say to people is, is if you see my pen twitching vigorously, you will know um, that at that stage that I'm trying to get you to wind up. And, and if you ignore it, I'm not sure what happens because no one has yet, but uh, you, you, you do need to wind up. Just in the interest of trying to get everyone in. And if you want to come in on a particular question, just look at me. Um, and maybe indeed committee members may ask you all to comment on it, but I'll bring you in if you, if you don't get the chance to come in. And if you all look away, the last person to look away is the one who will answer it first. So I hope that sort of sets the ground rules. Um, and the first question will be from John. John Finney. John. Thank you, Kavina. G good morning, panel. Uh, you, you may have uh, had... Uh uh, a, a look at the previous evidence. Uh, th th there's a, a little passage here I would like to start off by mentioning, and it, uh, a, a resume of the evidence from last time, and I quote here, it was felt, especially among the third sector witnesses, that support for social enterprise had, has been minimal up till now. The view was expressed that because many of the enterprises in the south are small, often employing fewer than five people, the Scottish enterprise is not interested in supporting them. There was also a belief that Scottish Enterprise, as well as other central-based organisations, do not have a grip or understanding of rural issues. Um, now, the Inter Enterprise and Skills Review spoke about the area having distinct economic needs. Can the panel tell me their views on what the major economic and social challenges faced by the South are, please? It's a question. Who would like to head off with that? You're all looking away. That was always dangerous. Um, and I wasn't paying attention to find out the last person to look. Who'd like to start off? Would somebody like to come in? If you're not going to, I'm going to... Steve. Yeah, uh, I'm just taking a couple of those points. Um, um, Scottish Enterprise is certainly interested in, in social enterprise, and we have a dedicated and very capable uh, resource uh, focused on that. Um, we treat social enterprise um, uh, through the same lens as, as any business, and therefore, um, if they are of scale, if they um, have growth potential, then we will support those. And I think um, there are around 20 or so um, um, uh, social enterprises that we uh, account manage at the moment, and there are around six of those, I think, are uh, in the, the south of Scotland. So um, I think um, for us, um, uh, we would like to see more activity in social enterprise and anything we can do to allow them to grow um, uh, is, is certainly uh, on, on, on our agenda. So we don't have anything against social, social enterprise, quite, quite the converse. Equally, um, in our capability, and we lead at the moment, you know, um, we have a resource looking at the rural economy. And it's our, uh, that unit that helps us gather our statistics and gather our evidence and then point uh, us towards our investment in the rural economy. And that will be vital uh, uh, to tap into and to grow uh, as, as the South of Scotland uh, uh, Economic Partnership grows. So it's there. Um, has it done enough in the past? Has it been a major focus for us? Um, we can argue and we can talk about that later. Later, but it's certainly there, and it's something we can build on. Chris, Chris wants to come in, John, unless you'd like to go back on that. No, Sorry. No, no. no, Chris. Okay. Um, we've been doing some work with the South of Scotland Partnership to understand the kind of the economy of the South of Scotland with partners, including uh, the local authorities. And I'd probably just offer a few remarks. The, the first thing to say is clear that the economy in the South of Scotland is different from the rest of Scotland. It's got lots of jobs and sectors which haven't been. Uh, growing with the exception of tourism 
uh, over the last uh, kind of five, six years. Um, it's a pretty low wage economy. Um, it's an economy that's got the highest levels of underutilisation of skills. And we think that that actually points to challenges in terms of uh, job creation in the South. I think it, it faces a number of challenges that other rural areas uh, face in terms of a, a digital infrastructure that isn't um, what it should be or could be. Challenges in relation to, to transport, not just in and out of the region, but critically within and across the region. And I, I think one of the things we've we found in our uh, conversations with employers and also with uh, college and university students is actually transport is a major barrier to accessing uh, kind of jobs and education. The, the third thing I'd, I'd kind of point to, and, and no doubt we will come on to talk about this, the, the demographics of the region are really challenging. Um, so working age population is expected to fall by about 8%, 12,000 people over the next uh, kind of 10 years. And, and critically, a big driver behind that is, is too many young people are, are leaving the region for, for work and, uh, and, for, and for study. The final thing I would say is we've got to be careful to just see, not to see the south of Scotland as some kind of homogenous whole. Um, there are huge differences in terms of how those issues play out, um, whether it's in Dumfries, whether it's in the North Borders, whether it's in Stranraer. So a lot of the early work we've been doing with the partnership is, is to try and understand those different dynamics and what the agency might do around that. John. Yeah, um, thanks. I, I wonder the perception then, Mr Dunlop, because you qualified, and, and I wanted to say that that, that was a view expressed about social enterprise, but, uh, but it was broader than and just that, and you qualified it, if, you said, if of scale, of there's a, a growth. Is that in itself a challenge? Because it's, it, it's maybe seen that you're dealing with the top, more uh, you know, prestigious companies where you know, I'm particularly interested in the social element that that's w the, 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 the new board will have, similar to um, what HI has. Is, is almost a presentational issue, of, uh, basically, um, if Scottish enterprise failed the South? Because that might be a view. Um, we'll take a couple of questions there. Um, I'll come back to the have we failed the South uh, secondly. I, I, our criteria for helping businesses, whether it's social enterprise or, or any other business, has over the past been in relation to their capability to grow, the size of the company in the, in the first place. Um, is it in the right territory uh, that, are, that are priorities uh, uh, for us? And, and, and therefore, um, that's where our energy and our investment has gone. And that's clearly meant that not everyone can get the support that Scottish enterprise uh, has to offer um, um, and that's been true of, of all of our uh, investment across across the patch um, I think and I, I maybe talk about going forward um, a, a bit later but we will certainly be looking at um, how do we begin to address the needs of the economy um, in, in, in where, wherever uh, issues are faced and we will do that through uh, different partnering arrangements but I'll maybe develop that point uh, later on but I would, I, would, I, would, I would challenge that we've failed uh, the south of Scotland. I think um, uh, we haven't. I think we've stuck to what our priorities, our investment priorities have been. And I would argue that we've, over the past, we've performed well. Have we been doing the right things at the right time? Well, I'm, I'm going to try and address some of that um, as, we, as we move forward as part of that whole approach to creating a more systematic uh, uh, economy um, with, our, with our fellow partners. So, so all of that is up for, or, uh, up for uh, rethought going forward. Okay, can I ask the panel what, what they would see the, the key strengths and assets of the, of the South to build on going forward, please? Uh, Michael. Um, Chair, um, I suppose I should first point, I'm from the Scottish Funding Council and I would say this, but we have two vibrant, powerful colleges in the South in which we invest um, over £20 million, serving thousands of learners each year and with a broad curricular offer. Um, they're doing so, as we've acknowledged earlier, in, in, a, in, a, in a diverse region um, characterised by remote locations, by rurality, um, and they're doing so with imagination, I think. One of the um, terrific outcomes, frankly, from the South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership, on, on which I think all of us are represented, is an investment in digital capacity for the two colleges. Um, and so through the South of Scotland, we'll be able, um, in the colleges, to create a, a virtual hub of learning with, um, think of it as essentially three hubs, um, off which will spin 20 spokes into different locations across the, across the geography of the South. And those spokes will be sited in schools, in businesses, in community centres. So the opportunity, I think, for 
building on the capacity of the college and not seeing that locked down into a physical location, but with a broad and diverse offer, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great opportunity on which we can seize. Anyone else want to come in? Douglas. Say a little bit from, from maybe the high perspective and touch on the, the social elements as well, maybe, Ed, John, if I may. I get, I get the strength in communities and the social development aspect has been key to what HIE have done since our predecessor was set up 53 years ago. Um, and it remains vitally important to what we do and how we do it today. Um, and it helps us get to all parts of the region. It's particularly important in our more rural and remote areas. And many of these kind of issues are, I suppose, mirrored in the, in the south. So um, I think social enterprise and our work with communities is an important opportunity for the south. We account manage around 150 social enterprises across the, hundred, uh, across the islands and islands. Um, and about 40 of those are um, almost community account managed. We work with whole communities in that concentrated place-based approach and I, I see that as a real opportunity particularly for the more remote and economically challenged uh, parts of the south of Scotland. Okay, uh, Malcolm, you'd like to... Yeah, just touch, uh, on, on the tourism aspect, just uh, firstly, um, let me say that small uh, businesses are actually the backbone of the tourism industry, not just in the south but right across the whole of the country. So down in the south, we, we work uh, together and have done for a number of years with um, over um, 2,000 businesses. Uh, and the challenge that we have is to get them to join up so that the, the total product offering that, that they have is seamless for, for visit, uh, visitors to access. There's a very rich tapestry of cultural events, social events, down right across the whole of the south of Scotland. And what we're trying to do with uh, the, the main players down there is to join it up so that it becomes a year-round destination. One of the weaknesses it has is it's very seasonal, again, like certain uh, aspects of, of the rest of the, the country. But they also have a, a fairly diversified business base. A lot of that uh, stemmed from foot and mouth, if you remember all those years back, um, particularly farms went into tourism. That meant that they started to engage with the food and drink industry down there, and there's a very rich offering. But they do have challenges. There are, there are infrastructure challenges, there are connectivity challenges, there are skills challenges. Uh, I think in um, Dumfries and Galloway, it's almost 13% of the workforce are in tourism, over 11% in the borders. And obviously, we are facing a major, major challenge uh, over the next uh, months and years to come in terms of skills, skill shortages, and also making sure that tourism is seen as a career for young people who live in the area to, uh, to adopt. OK, thank you very much, Pat. OK, there's a few follow-up questions on that. Uh, Jamie, you wanted to ask one, followed by Mike. Uh, thank you, Vina. It was just in response to uh, Mr Brody. Can I just clarify whether you said one of the economic pressures facing the area was a underutilisation of skills. Is that the phrase that you used? And, and can you just explain what you mean by that? Because underutilisation of skills is very different from lack of necessary skills or available skills. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is what I said. And if um, you allow me to go technical for just a moment, essentially skills underutilisation is where someone is working in a job with a particular qualification, um, but the level at which they're working with in that business is below the qualification that they hold. Um, so so we, we track this through the employer skills survey uh, right across Scotland as part of the analysis we've done for the regional um, skills investment plan for the south of Scotland. Um, that's highlighted as a major issue. Our kind of sense of that is that that's a kind of demand side issue. Um, so the answer is, is not necessarily to say, um, let's skill people to lower levels. Um, but actually there's a challenge there in terms of the the quality of work and the quality of jobs that there are in the region. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'd like to follow up the rather direct question that John Finney uh, asked uh, Steve Dunlop and um, whether Scottish Enterprise had failed the south of Scotland. And if you'll forgive me for saying so, it was a, you would say that, wouldn't you, response, which is no, we haven't. What I'd like to know from you then in that case is why do you think that we are now looking through a bill, setting up a South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. If it's not the fault of Scottish Enterprise, why has the demand been there? Surely it is to fill a gap, and surely Scottish Enterprise can't just say, well, it's not our fault. 
Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, as I say, uh, we, we have resources and limited resources or resources within which to work. And, and over the last 10 years, we have focused those resources on, on sectors and on growing companies uh, that would, we believed would have the maximum impact for growth for Scotland. Um, on that basis, we have supported companies, uh, the demand that comes towards us, um, uh, who have the capability to grow and in, in those places and those, in those sectors. It has meant that you know, through that model, that the number of companies that have come from the south have been fewer than other parts of Scotland, and that's a fact. So, um, now, that has meant that there is a gap, um, but we are not the only people who supplies, uh, supply business support. There's Business Gateway, there's local authorities, and, and, and so on. But we, in the past, have chosen to focus on that. However, I do recognise um, that the issue of place and the economies of place is an area that we would want to do more in. And as I look at our organisation today, we are reorganising ourselves in a, with a view to three things, looking at how we uh, promote Scotland and regions and places on an international basis, but secondly, how we participate much more fully in regional economics and regional economic partnerships. Quite soon, Scotland will be covered by regional economic partnerships of one form or another, and I want Scot uh, Scottish Enterprise to be a full participant in those. So we will uh, move back into place. We cannot work uh, uh, nationally, regionally and locally, so we will need to partner with the South and with High, as we, we currently do, and other regional economic partnerships to work on a systematic basis. So I recognise that there have been gaps from our provision. That, that is probably uh, not unusual, given the limited resources we've had. But I will be deploying our resources in a way, as we move forward, that will recognise the importance of regions. And therefore, our relationship with the, the, the Emerging South of Scotland partnership will be really key. You're differentiating what we do at a local basis, a regional and national basis. And I would absolutely commit the Scottish Enterprise in the core skills that we have around international and business growth and many other things, we'll continue, uh, we will continue to support the South fully. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Maureen, you wanted to ask a question. Um, yes, I mean, we've mentioned rurality and uh, agriculture. Um, clearly, the southwest of Scotland has more or less become the hub um, for milk production in Scotland. Um, it's a product where um, there's a huge potential for value added. Can I ask what, um, what um, discussions you've had with the Rural Leaders Forum in terms of um, growing uh, markets for milk production and value-added products from milk. Who'd like to head off on that? Um, Michael, are you, are you trying to catch my eye or trying to avoid well, it? I was trying to avoid your eye, uh, <laughs> um, I, I can give an answer to that question. It's not a terribly positive one. It's simply to okay. say um, uh, the SFC itself has had no such discussions. Um, one of the things we ask from our colleges uh, as we develop outcome agreements with them is that they illustrate how they're responding to the demands of businesses in the region that they serve. Um, I don't recall specific provision for dairying in either of the outcome agreements, but I could certainly check that for, for the member and report back. It's a very specific question. I don't have the answer to that, but I'd be delighted to, you know, to reach out and find out and, and respond uh, uh, separately to you. Okay. On the basis everyone is definitely now looking away, uh, John, it looks like yours is the next question. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, from our perspective, there are certainly some challenges in the South. Uh, for example, one of the figures we're given is that on business startups, either in Dumfries and Galloway, there are only 31 per 10,000 people, whereas the Scottish average is 50. So, I mean, specifically, I'm going to mention, well, I've mentioned business startups. Another challenge seems to be that there's a lack of medium and larger enterprises in the south of Scotland. Um, do you see these as the major challenges? Have you any reasons why these are major challenges? Or are there other ones as well that you identify? Steve, do you want to kick off for that? Um, yes. Um, I think there is, there is a, a lower start-up rate, and, and, um, and I would um, defer to uh, Business Gateway uh, colleagues on, on that front, and the pipeline that flows through that mechanism isn't isn't that strong. So that that is definitely a challenge for us. 
Having said that, those companies that do start up, there seems to be a greater resilience from those companies. The, uh, the survival rate actually is ahead of most other parts of Scotland. So, so that's a good thing. Um, there are actually many businesses and as a proportion of businesses that are 50 plus per population, there are more of those in the South, actually. Um, so so it's quite, uh, I think one of my colleagues said, it's a very mixed picture. It's not a homogenous uh, place, but there are those underlying characteristics um, are, are, are indeed a, a, a challenge. Have a, a larger number of kind of small or medium businesses rather than, you know, one big one, because we lost like pennies yeah. recently. And, you know, I just wonder, is that putting all your eggs in one basket? I, I personally um, would support in an economy that is very adaptive and very resilient to change. If you have major, single major employers and we see the consequences of those, you know, and that happens all the time, then the, the consequences and the ability for an, an economy to, to adapt to single major employers is much more difficult. I think where you see regions where there is a real diversity of businesses made up of many uh, small and medium sizes, then they can adapt and flex. But that's not to say that we, you don't want you know, some underpinning major businesses. So I think like all things, it's a balance. But when, we, when I look at the statistics there, there is a culture of business and self-employment and, and, and albeit micro-business. And therefore, I think there's something positive uh, to work on there. And I think you know, we would you know, obviously be very keen for the new, uh, to support the new partnership in in looking into that business space. Another point that I would say, and it's more a reflection on what we do and what I would want to support the new agency in doing, is that I, I think we have been passive in the sense that businesses come to us and looking for support. I think we now need, as an agency, and I would, I would certainly want to uh, uh, collaborate with the the South is to, for us as a system to go hunting and gathering for that talent, to dig it out, to spot where the talent is and wrap around it and, and, and go looking for it in a much more proactive way. Uh, and therefore, I think that's a kind of cultural change for us as a system to be able to uh, step into. So for me, I, I, I think, you know, particularly over the next few years, I think there's going to be lots of economic shock. Um, we need a business base that is, that is capable of responding. They can only respond if we as a system, a collective, can give advice about what's coming their way and, and, and pre uh, presenting a state of readiness. And therefore, that again is a systematic uh, uh, response that we are beginning to build uh, uh, much greater capability. Of. Okay, I don't know if anyone else, uh, I mean, I wonder, Skills Development Scotland, do, do you just kind of react to where the needs are, or are you trying to kind of consciously encourage people to start our businesses? So we don't have a, a, a remit in relation to business startup uh, per se. Um, I, I think in respect of the skills challenges that we face in the south with a number of um, very small micro businesses, there are, that, that does present a number of challenges for us. I think the first is actually about getting um, those employers to kind of understand and articulate what they need in relation to future skills. That's, that's often a problem. Um, I think we've recognised that um, smaller companies often have challenges in terms of, you know, access and training for their staff or taking on apprenticeships in particular. We are looking, we are currently piloting um, approaches across rural Scotland looking at things like shared apprenticeships and host apprenticeship models, which allow smaller companies to uh, fully participate in these programmes. We've also introduced a rural uplift um, around training provision for um, modern apprenticeship uh, training in rural areas, which is, you know, yes, targeted at rural areas, but in part recognising uh, some of the challenges that very small companies face. OK. I mean, following on from that, a young people leaving the, the area, I mean, that, that would be true of a lot of rural areas. Um, have you any particular comments on the south as to young people there and how we attract more young people in? And I would be interested in Mr Cowan's view as to are there simil what are the similarities between the high area and the south of Scotland, and, but are there differences too between them, but especially about young people? Douglas, before you come in, uh, Michael was quite keen to answer the last question, and I'm, I, I'm sorry I didn't get, get you in in time. Michael, would you like to try and answer the last question, and, and if you feel you can contribute to that, then I'll bring in Douglas. I'll, I'll do so very briefly, and it perhaps touches on the follow-up question as well, but as, as Chris was saying, um, on the question of business startup, um, skills provision in this respect is important, I think, and... Um, as we were doing some work over the summer, this was joint work between Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council, we were talking about the sort of skills that um, um, we needed to um, 
inculcate in learners of the future. And this notion of enterprise and entrepreneurship and the capacity to be can do in your outlook is very much at the core of that, that ambition. So um, while it's not a direct response to what are you doing to stimulate business startup, it, you know, the, 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 the skill supply side is on that, I think, and that perhaps touches on the point also of helping to keep young people in the region. Thank you. Um, Douglas, I'll bring you in, and then Chris, if I may. Um, OK, um, maybe a little bit on... I mean, I'd agree with much of what Steve said around the business base and the lack of uh, large businesses. We see that as well in, in, in our part of the country. Um, so many similarities. And I guess the answer is, is around being adaptive and resilient, uh, much like Steve said. In, in, in terms of young people, um, I think that um, young people are a focus for Highlands and Islands Enterprise. The area, while we have seen significant growth in population, I think population has grown by 23% um, over the past 50-odd years, compared to 3% growth at Scotland level. Some, the demographics look particularly challenging. Um, we're an older population than Scotland's and, and getting older faster, some areas uh, more so than others. And it tends to be the more rural you go, the older the population gets, and, and therefore the, the fewer young people are. So um, I guess the answer is working with uh, partners. So education is important, employment and career opportunities are, are important. Um, and it's creating the conditions to attract and retain those young people. We've done a fair bit of research on that over the years. Uh, we think we know what some of the key drivers are. And it goes beyond that. So there's uh, challenges in some parts about housing. So you can't attract people unless there's accommodation for them. So the whole mix of issues and, and I guess how these issues work is different in different parts um, of the Highlands and Islands, and I suspect will be different in different parts of the south of Scotland. So it's very much locally based solutions working with partners uh, to address the specific opportunities and challenges in these uh, local economies. Now, can place based approach again, I'm afraid. I mean, do you think, obviously, your physical area is a lot bigger than, than the south of Scotland. And if you're in Lewis, you can't possibly get to even Inverness to shop or go to a college or, or whatever. Um, so do you think, it seems to me, as a, as a central belt person, that the, the challenges facing the, the Highlands and Islands are much greater than those facing the south. Is that your perspective, or do you not want to say that? Well, the, the geography is bigger, the population is less, the population density is, is significantly lower in the Highlands and Islands than uh, the south of Scotland. I think it's uh, the only comparable place in, in Europe, the Highlands and Islands, I think, is kind of northern and Scandinavia. So it's, it's, I think we've got different challenges in terms of population density and also in terms of the islands. You know, I think 90-ish inhabited islands kind of adds to the challenge. Um, Part of the response to that uh, a while ago was the creation of uh, University of the Hills and Islands and that kind of remote uh, learning model uh, to provide greater access across a greater part of the region. And that, that's clearly had a significant impact. Again, I think the answers in the south are slightly different because the geography and the issues are slightly different, but there is certainly a model there that's worth looking quite hard at. Okay, thank you. Chris wants to come in and then Steve. Just picking up on the specific question about why so many young people leave the area. We've actually been talking to school students and college students through uh, summer and autumn to try and get a sense of that. And I think it's fair to say there are some kind of push factors and pull factors. Um, and in terms of why, why people are leaving, the things that, that we're hearing is it's about the lack of availability of HE. So people feel they need to leave the region to, to study. Um, there's a perception of a lack of good quality jobs in the region that, that in a sense that to get ahead, you need to leave. Um, and I think it's fair to say a kind of lack of awareness at the same time, a limited understanding of some of the really good jobs that there are in the region. So there's a job of work to be done there. I think on the pool side, um, and this is hard to mitigate against, I think young people citing the attractions of city living, the university experience and all that that brings. And I think that's just a given. Um, what can you do about it? It's a really interesting question. I think what you shouldn't do about it is to try and build a wall around the region and say that you can't leave. But what you can do um, there are many things you can do, and some of these, I think, um, are, are already underway. You can broaden the opportunities to stay, whether it's through apprenticeships or whether it's through uh, access to the college provision that Michael's talked about. You can make places more attractive to, for people to, to live in. Um, and Douglas uh, mentioned some of the work we're doing in the Highlands and Islands. We're doing some really interesting work with Western Isles Council at the moment, where we're offering a foundation apprenticeship to every S5 and S6 student linked to a local job critically linked to access to housing. So overcoming some of the barriers that are not around skills. And I think finally, 
um, a, a critical role for the agencies going to, to be making the region an attractive place for people to come back and live and work um, if they go away to study. So I, th I think there's no, there's no single answer in terms of our council against you know, trying to build a wall around the region and say, you know, people shouldn't leave. In some cases, that can be a good thing if they come back. Steve, you want to come in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on, build on Chris's point. I, I, I think, you know, for us, more better jobs, you know, and accessible jobs and visible jobs is clearly the answer. And I think, you know, to you know, go back to John's point um, about major employers, I, I, I hope it won't be too far in the future where we can be building regional prospectuses and each of those regional prospectuses add up to a prospectus for, for Scotland overall and that that prospectus will then be handed into our international sales force through SDI and sold internationally whether it's for foreign direct investment whether it's for export whether it's for capital human or, or, or financial and as well as gluing together our, our, um, all our Scottish capability in international markets. But at the heart of it will be having a prospectus that we can say, here is what the South has to offer. And when we look at that prospectus, those are genuinely investable, investable uh, uh, projects and places that do deal with the complexity of making a place, joining up all those opportunities. And that is something that we would want to progress uh, very quickly across uh, that network of Scotland and therefore make it much more easy to attract foreign direct investment of all scales that gives us a chance to create those more better jobs. Stuart, did you want to... Uh, and then Maureen's got a question. Yeah. I, I, no, thank you. It's been suggested to me that one of the issues in retention, but more probably in attracting people back to rural areas, uh, younger if not young people, uh, is partner preference and employment needs. In other words, if uh, someone you might want to get back has a partner who's got a set of needs that can't be met. And I just wonder to what extent um, the people at the, the end of the table here are addressing that issue, because if one can help the partner find the position and have their needs met, you will get them. A two-for-one offer I've just had whispered in my, my, my ear. I suppose that's a reasonable way. Now, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but, I'm, but, I, but I just was interested to see, first of all, am I correct in the assumption that that's part of the issue? And secondly, is anyone uh, addressing it? Right, I, I don't know who wants to go on that. Douglas, I'll let you lead on that. Oh, uh, I'll go first anyway and say a little bit. I think I think we've picked up similar things, and um, uh, population issues are, are a priority in a couple of the community planning partnerships in our area. And I think particularly the Outer Hebrides is looking at a number of interventions around population. And I'm pretty sure one of them was about how you uh, kind of join the dots a bit to help um, partners of, of people moving in find, find appropriate employment. Now, I, d I don't know much more of the details about it, but I'm pretty sure it has been looked at, uh, certainly in Outer Hebrides and possibly in other areas as well. So there is an awareness of it, and it's quite difficult to do, though, I believe. <laughs> does, does anyone else want to, to comment on that? Um, or maybe we'll move on to the next question, which is, is, is Colin. Th thanks very much, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Can I, I just follow up on... Uh, the questions John, John were asking about young people leaving the region and I appreciate their pushing and pull factors but it is probably the single biggest challenge that we face around the demographics of the region and, and that's partly um, people leaving the region and, and partly um, not giving people the opportunities in the region if they choose or wish to choose to come back to the region but does that not expose the failures of the existing agencies in supporting the south of Scotland? I pick up on the point that, that, that Michael raised earlier about the new south of Scotland economic partnership and the investment they're making in the local college we have a challenge in Dumfries and Galloway, that, that even compared to the Highlands and Islands, that, that the number of people of working age with no skills at all is twice the level in the south of Scotland than it is in the Highlands and Islands. It's not a rural issue. There's a specific issue in the south of Scotland that existing agencies are, are frankly not tackling at the moment. And is that not a criticism of the Funding Council that actually you're saying that a big investment from the new partnership, it took them to come along to make that investment? Is that not a failure for the Funding Council? Because we don't have, for example, a south of Scotland university. 
but we have a Highlands and Islands University, and we have a university campus, fortunately now, starting to show incremental growth at the Crichton, but frankly not at the level at all that's going to be attractive enough to get young people to stay in the region. And is that not something that the Funding Council should be tackling? Right, to give everyone fair warning, Michael, you're going to go first, and, and Chris, you'll go second, and then I'll let Steve come in at the end. <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, I think the creation uh, of the hub and spoke model is 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 not a failing with the funding council. Um, the fact is there is limited resource, as um, Steve has said earlier, and we try to distribute that resource as fairly as possible as we can across the colleges and universities all over the country. Um, that said, the priorities that we adopt for that resource are changing as well, and increasingly we are asking our colleges and our universities to focus on upskilling uh, to deliver more. Um, accessible chunks of learning to those already in work so that they can develop their skills. We've also got, um, and Chris is right, there isn't enough of it, but we have got a wide range of HE provision in the South. As, as you know, the Crichton Partnership, and led by Barbara Kelly, is a, is a, who is an ardent supporter uh, of the South of Scotland Partnership, the Crichton Partnership, with representation from the University of the West of Scotland, from the University of Glasgow, from the Open University, um, that is a vibrant presence in the region, working with the two colleges, as is on the east, I guess, um, the offer from Heriot Watt University. But uh, Mr. Smith, if your charge is, you know, can we do more? I think we can do more, and that's something on which we'll focus. Chris. Can I briefly go back to my initial remarks and the reasons why young people leave? It's not down to any one reason. And I think looking for any single one problem, or it's one single solution that we can adopt to to fix this is, is probably not going to get us to where we need to be. Looking at the experience, we, we, we did some work with Highlands and Islands Enterprise about four years ago around that very issue. Um, and where we got to was quite an interesting place of saying, yes, there is absolutely a role for broadening the, the HE and the apprenticeship offer in the Highlands and Islands to encourage people to stay. But we've also got to look at the extent to which um, you use that offer and good quality jobs to bring people into the region. I think in terms of the demographics, the, the, the challenge is, is stark. Um, the south of Scotland is likely to have one of the highest dependency ratios in terms of people in work and people out of work in the next uh, 20 years of anywhere in Scotland. I think that requires a focus that goes beyond young people and looks at what are we doing to kind of keep people in the workforce, keep them healthy, um, connect them to jobs, and as, as Michael says, upskill and reskill people so that they have got you know opportunities to be part of the um, part of the workforce uh, longer into their careers. The products that Skills Development Scotland have been delivering across Scotland in the last few years have met the needs of the south of Scotland. Yep. I mean, our, our, our primary uh, offer that, that we have as a product is the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. When we inherited the Modern, when, when Skills Development Scotland was formed in 2008, we delivered 500 um, MAs across the south of Scotland. Uh, last year, we delivered nearly 1,400 uh, modern apprenticeship starts in the region. And those modern apprenticeships are, um, are determined by demand. You know, if there's a demand there from employers, we will fund it. We've been working hard to establish um, foundation apprenticeships in the region. Um, I think it's fair to say we've got a toehold. Um, we haven't quite got um, where I think we would like to, to get to, but we're working hard with the local authorities and indeed with the colleges to see how we can broaden um, the offer of apprenticeships in the region. Mr. Cummins. Yeah, and I think um, our part in, in this is that, I mean, whilst we support um, uh, around 110 or so uh, account managed companies in the south, we've actually helped, I think, more than 220 uh, companies around exporting and around 150 investing in, in their capability around innovation. And at the, at the heart of all of that activity is about driving and persuading investing in companies to drive up their leadership capability, their management capability and, and their skills capability. Um, so that's something, again, that's us trying to stimulate that demand side for the right, the right type of skills. So again, I think it points to us requiring to continue to work in a, a more systematic approach together. What proportion of your resources at Scottish Enterprise are invested in the south of Scotland? Um, it goes up and down every every year, subject to that demand. I think uh, last year we spent around four million. The year before, uh, five million. Uh, I've, I've tracked it fairly consistent ar around those levels. That's directly into companies uh, in in the south. That doesn't account for the 
headquarters and the 60 staff that are based there, and it doesn't actually track the number or, or the level of investment we make in companies that are headquartered elsewhere, but actually deploy uh, uh, work uh, and labour in, in the south. So, but at a base level, uh, uh, those are the figures. You were to therefore consider what the overall percentage was of, of your resources supporting the economy in the south of Scotland. What would you put that figure at? Um, I, I, it would be very difficult to do that. I, I don't, we don't really account in those terms. So I, if I gave you a figure, it would most likely be wrong. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to give you different strands of figures that might help build a picture. The way I look at it is the population of the south of Scotland is defined by the bill, which is Scottish Borders and Dumfries and Galloway, as about 5% of the population of Scotland. Would you say you spend as much as 5% of your overall budget support? I think so, yeah. Because at the moment, three to four million pounds is about... One percent of your budget, you know. Yeah, but the, yeah, but our budget is 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 made up. It's a complicated budget, but but I. So as I say, I'm, I'm very happy to give you the, the detail behind it. Um, in some areas, we 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 are able to say that we would the spend in the areas proportionate to other areas. In some areas, it would be more. Some areas would be less. And, and you touched on earlier the criteria for your investments around the capability to grow, the size, and the sectors. Well, that clearly rules out a huge number of businesses in the south of Scotland because, with the best will in the world, regenerating Stranraer Waterfront um, is not going to grow the Scottish economy, but it's going to grow an economy in Wigtonshire which is really struggling. But that's frankly not your role. So is that a failure by Scottish enterprise or is that a failure in terms of the direction you're giving at a national level as to what your priority should be? Um, I don't think, well, I, I, I'm uncomfortable talking about it in, in, in relation to failure. What we've, what we've done as an organisation has prioritised where our investment should go and that's, that's where we've followed. I think it is true to say that we have got out of, over the last 10 years, issues around regeneration uh, and, and, and investing in physical places. I think there's a role for us to go back into that space, but equally there's a role for the Emerging South of Scotland Partnership to be in that place. So this will be an area where we partner and that, and that partnership will be driven by uh, the, you know, the, the, the scale of the oppor opportunity. Um, so, so, so that's what I would say. Uh, because one of the issues that's been raised is around the boundary of the new agency, which is the Scottish Borders and, and Dumfries and Galloway, and there are very, very strong reasons behind that. But if the agency's role is to fill that gap around place, around regeneration that hasn't been filled by Scottish Enterprise, what will you do for those areas such as South Clydesdale, South Ayrshire, that are not in the boundary of the new partnership? Will that mean you have to change your focus because a lot of the challenges they face are similar to the challenges of the borders in Dumfries and Galloway? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, I, as I said earlier, I think um, you know, in the not too distant future, Scotland will be covered by different forms of economic partnership, whether it's driven by a city deal or a growth deal. The Ayrshire's have a growth deal. Uh, and therefore, we will be participating alongside Ayrshire, the Ayrshire's in that growth deal. And therefore, the solutions that we partner with those, uh, with those regional economic partnerships will vary subject to what the economy needs of us. So I'm interested as, as, a, as an agency beginning to ask the question is, rather than what are we prepared to offer the economy, what does it need of us? Because I think what the Ayrshire's will require from us might be different from what is required up in the Aberdeen community, different from what Edinburgh requires. So I'm prepared for us to begin to flex and change and focus uh, on what is required of us in those circumstances. And Colin's now going to have to apologise to Jamie Stewart after the meeting for, for taking a question that Jamie had wanted to ask. Uh, but we are going to move on to the next question, which is going to be Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've, we've had some discussion about Scottish Enterprises account management, and I want to just develop it a little bit, uh, but not a huge, huge depth. Um, wh what I've heard is that there is going to be a shift in the approach that will create uh, more uh, flex, uh, flexibility. And indeed, we've also heard um, that there's been significant support given to companies that are not account managed. And I think it would be useful just to understand how the non-account managed part of what Scottish Enterprise has been doing is going to be managed in future. And in particular, um, how we heard that companies who are headquartered elsewhere are uh, often supported. And, and how is that going to work in future when the headquarters is, for the sake of argument, in Perth, um, but the uh, main employment is in the borders. How, how are we going to see that working? Is that going to be Scottish Enterprise-led, or will that be the new agency? In other words, how has account management been working, particularly in the south? Has it been flexible enough, but also 
how is it going to work in future? And I think I'm looking for a relatively concise answer. <laughs> to, to a relatively <laughs> long question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Steve, I, I think probably that's you. And, and Douglas, you may want to, to contribute briefly uh, to, to the short answer. Okay. Um, yes, uh, we, we are. So, so our, our approach is to, to look at companies of a certain scale and, and, a, and a certain um, uh, makeup that we believe uh, could grow and stimulate Scotland's economy. We recognise that that has left many companies out with that, that arrangement. What we plan to do, along with our uh, partner agencies, is create a digital platform where all businesses across Scotland can have access to uh, high quality business support and over a short period of time have access to grants through that system. That will mean that we will reach more and more uh, uh, businesses and support them in many ways in a, and in a much more consistent way. So, so the reach will be, will be much greater and we'll do that in partnership. That will free up our human capability, our capacity to then focus on the companies that, again, that we think can deliver the best outcomes for Scotland. We will also, though, not restrict ourselves to sectors and we won't restrict ourselves to certain uh, areas. We will open that up and we will be much more opportunity driven. And we will work hard with our partner uh, agencies to work out where are those handoffs. Those handoffs happen already between Business Gateway uh, and Scottish Enterprise, between High and between SE, and that happens day in, day out. I think what we need to do is make that more transparent. Uh, Douglas, do you want to come in briefly? Uh, yep. Um, the only thing I would probably add to that is that uh, frequently our engagement with business clients that have got growth potential and where, I guess, we share geography in some way, shape or form is we work through account teams. So there'll be a lead hook, which may be in HIE or maybe in SE, but that would include other support around it. And we actually do it collaboratively and we work together and we've been doing that for a number of, of years. Um, one example that I know well is r and Aromatics. Aaron is in the Highlands and Islands, but they've got premises in the central belt. And uh, we work closely and collaboratively in supporting that client. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Maureen, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, can I just get a sense of what the current footprint is of Scottish Enterprise in the borders in Dumfries and Galloway? You said you had 60 staff at headquarters. What exactly do you, do you currently have in, in the south of Scotland? Uh, yeah, we've got two offices. We've got one in Selkirk and one in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, I, um, it's a shared office. Um, I don't know. I've been there, but I don't couldn't tell you the address. So okay. it's a shared. It's a shared office. Okay. Um, so those are the two assets that we, that we have at the minute. Um, those people in those offices um, uh, work for Scottish Enterprise, but in some pl uh, places they share space with Business Gateway. And those, those people will deliver a range of national services for us uh, at the moment. So are, are that 60 staff, are they in one of those offices or are they across the South? They're across both of them. I think, both. It's, I think it's 40 and 20, roughly speaking. Right. But they'll move around. Those, those people, as I say, um, serve, are, are delivering services that are pan-Scotland. So whilst they're HQ there, we have very flexible working arrangements and we have 11 offices across Scotland and people will move uh, uh, subject to uh, their, uh, uh, their workload and, and their subject matter. Okay. Can I return to something that the John Finney at the beginning kind of briefly mentioned uh, regarding um, a social enterprise uh, support? Um, you said that uh, Scottish Enterprise has 20 account managed <coughs> social enterprises across Scotland, six of which are in the south of Scotland. Um, could you tell me what sectors those six are in currently? I know two of them are housing associations, um, and I can't remember uh, who the others are, to be honest. One of the things that came up from a previous evidence session um, was that other businesses kind of regard social enterprises as organisations that will do something for very little money, um, rather than give them the due weight that they really deserve. So I wonder how we can grow Scottish enterprise, uh, grow social enterprises uh, under the new body. I wouldn't, 
I personally wouldn't agree with that distinction. I think some of the most innovative businesses in Scotland just now are social enterprises. Um, I think they do good by doing good business. So I don't, you know, they are not charities, they are businesses. And that's why when we view a social enterprise, we view it as a business. And, 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 and that, uh, and, and certainly we have, as I say, really excellent capability who is trying to grow that sector uh, and grow the scale and the ambition of that sector. So for me, I would, I wouldn't, I would be very uncomfortable in categorising as as a almost something that doesn't uh, do business the way other businesses do. So, so I think there is a huge uh, talent base in Scotland around social enterprise. We see it every day, and we will continue to support it. And are there particularly uh, social enterprises in the Highlands and Islands? Um, you know that that, that maybe there is a possibility that, that that can be taken up and perhaps rec replicated in an area like the south of Scotland? Douglas, I think that's going to come down to you. <laughs> I, I would think there is scope to do so. Um, the social enterprise sector is particularly strong in the Highlands and Islands. We've got a disproportionately large number of, of social enterprises um, and they add significantly to the economy. I think 100 144 million pounds worth of GVA social enterprise delivers to the Highlands and Islands economy. There was a census carried out in 2017 looking at social enterprise across Scotland and, and we asked them to pull out some of the data for the south of Scotland through the work of the partnership. And that tells us there are 441 social enterprises at that time in the south of Scotland delivering over 70 million worth of GVA. So there is certainly something there to work with. And there, I think there is an opportunity for a new agency to engage with that sector in maybe a different way than it has been engaged with in the past. Has that been helped by a gradual shift in the way uh, land is owned in the Highlands compared to perhaps the south of Scotland where there are quite a few very large landowners? Uh, possibly that will be part of it, but um, I suspect not, not a massive part. Uh, certainly the, the land reform has made a big, big difference in the Highlands and Isles, certainly in, in some parts more than others. Um, we look after the Scottish Land Fund, and I was looking at, at, at some of the data. In terms of inquiries, actually the third largest number of inquiries per local authority is in Dumfries and Galloway at the moment. So there's actually quite a lot of interest in parts of the south, at least, um, in communities acquiring land and assets. Perfect. Um, I think the next question is uh, Jamie. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, convener. I'll, I'll do my best to recover uh, my question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, 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 and I do want to carry on the theme, actually, and, and I will try not in, infringe on um, uh, another question, which I know is coming up later, and that's regarding reallocation of, uh, of, of, of staff and resource. But, but I, th I think it might be a good place to kick that conversation off. Um, obviously... To as he took your question, Jamie, <laughs> but lead on. <laughs> uh, and, uh, as, we're, as on the panel, we're represented by a number of uh, national agencies that have a remit right across Scotland, including the south and the bordering areas that Colin talked about. Um, is it your expectation that when this new agency uh, comes into play, that the existing uh, staff and resource that you have deployed in the south um, will be reallocated or you will be able to redeploy some of that uh, targeted resource to perhaps some of the surrounding areas, with uh, focus on, for example, the Ayrshires, um, where they're not under the remit of the new agency, but may be able to benefit from increased focus from your agencies. Who'd like to add off on that? Malcolm, do you, uh, 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 Steve, uh, I'm going to bring some <laughs> of the others in if I can, and, 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 and you'll definitely get a chance, don't worry. Uh, as a national agency, uh, we, we have um, 12 offices across uh, the whole of Scotland, two of which are in the south of Scotland. One is at White Sands uh, in Dumfries and the other one is uh, in Selkirk. So we, we already have a resource that's there. What we'd be looking for is to contract with the South of Scotland agency to look at how can we deliver tourism, not necessarily uh, in terms of increasing headcount, but actually utilising the resources and skill sets that exist within Visit Scotland already and making those available 
to uh, to the new agency. A, a lot of the work that we do through quality assurance, etc., it covers off, as I mentioned earlier, we work with over 2,000 businesses in the south of Scotland, and we have over uh, 540 that are in the quality assurance scheme. So we already have broad-based coverage in that area. And we're, and we're also delivering at the moment the Sea South Scotland uh, marketing campaign. So it, it's not necessarily about physically moving people, but it is actually about utilising the resource. Uh, members come in. If I could be maybe more specific, I appreciate you already are all working in the South of Scotland. That's the point of my question, is that if the new agency uh, deploys additional resource and capital into the area, does that free up? anything from your agencies that you'll be able to uh, redeploy any of that resource, finance or capital into the surrounding areas which will not benefit from the new agency? That's my specific question. Who, who'd like to... Uh, Michael, do you want to go on that? Um, the, the, the Scottish Funding Council is a, a headquarters based organisation, <coughs> excuse me, operating out of Edinburgh. So um, we, we will have no staff um, to deploy to the new agency, that won't free any staff up. I suppose the point to make in this respect, um, it's a related point, is that as a result of the creation of the new agency, we have appointed a, a, a new member of staff at assistant director level to manage the region as an entity, which will take some, um, which takes some, um, some additional resource, I think, in the early years of the agency. Do you want to come on? Um, thank you. Um, it's simply too early for us to say which, um, um, how our staff in the south will de be deployed. Our, as I said uh, to a previous question, our, the, the 60 staff that we have in the south are working for us uh, on a programme that serves all of Scotland. And some of those um, um, uh, uh, folks are serving all of Scotland on issues that, that will retain, be retained uh, by Scottish enterprise. So it's simply too early to, to make those kind of uh, calculations or assumptions. And we absolutely want to take all our staff in, in Scottish enterprise with us, the trade unions, and, and have those positive discussions uh, with the emerging uh, agencies. So it's simply too early to say. I think, though, to your point, though, um, about how we support, again, in regions and in places, those, those, other, those other places, as I've said before, I am really keen and very willing for us to begin to examine how do we deploy our account management, our, our business support, our, um, our support around exports, all of those things into and around uh, the regions where, uh, uh, where uh, there is a demand for those services. That doesn't mean to say we will move back to what we did before as local economic uh, agencies where we had dedicated uh, offices in places that served only that place, but we will be more uh, focused on how do we support the, the regions um, uh, going forward. But I'd want to keep an open mind about how best we uh, make use of our human capital in that sense. Okay. Um, uh, Chris, you wanted to come in, and then we'll go to the next question, which is from Richard Isle. So, Chris. So we've oh, got, no, sorry, Gail Ross wants a quick follow-up on that. Sorry, Chris, first. So we've got 45 staff who are actually based in the region, and most of those staff are working in uh, schools um, as careers advisors are working in one of our um, career centres. So, in a sense, they are already based in the region. Um, I've got a team of about half a dozen staff who are all based in Glasgow or Edinburgh, or the north of Scotland who are supporting me in the work we're doing to develop the, the regional skills investment plan. And, and I'm clear that when the agency comes into view, we will still have our local staff working in the region and we will still support the agency through uh, some of the national teams that I manage. I think the way we, uh, we, we invest about seven million pounds um, in the region uh, in relation to staff, property, and most of that is around um, our apprenticeship funding as well. We would see that staying um, and we view the agency not as duplicating or replacing what we do, but actually being a really important complement to what we do. So we think the agency's got a really important role to help in you know, changing the, the dynamic of the economy in the South, but, but from a very parochial point of view, helping us with some of our shared ambitions um, that we've got with the Funding Council around skills as well. Okay. Of a brief comment. Briefly. Is, is, is it that therefore the case then that you see the new agency being as well as all the work that you currently do and not instead of in any way? I, I'll not speak for others, but certainly from a Skills Development Scotland perspective, that's absolutely how we see it. Um, I'm a member of the, the SOSET board, and that has been a strong theme through the SOSET board that this is not about um, replacing 
or taking away. Actually, the problems of the South are deep-seated and they're going to take a long-term commitment and that's going to require a long-term commitment from all the partners that are around this table. Come yes, briefly. We will still, still serve all of Scotland from the South, so it be as well as and in partnership. There will be some areas where we will partner very closely, but uh, yeah. Okay, I, I'm now going to bring in the Deputy Convener, uh, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. It's just a really quick question, and it's for Malcolm, actually. Um, as you'll know, and as Douglas will be very aware, um, the NC500 in the Highlands has been extremely successful, but not without its challenges. And there was a suggestion that something like that might work in the south of Scotland. I don't know if that has been explored. Obviously, HIE don't lead on the NC500. It is a private company. But just to get your opinions on, has it been discussed? Is it possible? Is it welcome? Would it work? Uh, yes, and, and uh, I think the, the key learnings from the success NC500 have been taken on board. Uh, I have to say, actually, there's no shortage of uh, trails currently being developed across the whole of Scotland at the moment. But uh, it, to my mind, that is actually a potential for the borders and Dumfries and Galloway, which is actually about slow touring rather than racing around you know, uh, one particular part of the country. Uh, and what that would actually do, if, if you think about the, the average length of stay of a visitor in, in, in the south of Scotland is about 4.3 nights. And that, that compares to the average in Scotland of 7.2. So if we were able to get, it comes back to infrastructure, if we were able to get the infrastructure in place, if we take the learnings from NC500, like passing places, making sure that facilities uh, are, are all in play at the same time, then there is a great opportunity. And I would actually like to see that particular area take lead. Perhaps if you're if you're looking at uh, e-vehicles, so you know you can actually do something very very different and position itself as a, as a destination uh, apart from the rest of, of Scotland. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to put on the record that we are trying to promote the NC500 as a slow touring route as well, rather than a racetrack. Um, sounds like you're trying to promote competition to it. And on the basis it's Christmas and, and, and John has signified he wants to come in. John, would you like to come in? You're very kind, Kavina. <clears throat> Mr Ruffett, you obviously take cognizance of all the deficiencies in the aspects of the NC500, the most significant of which was this was something that people felt was imposed in communities rather than... Uh, communi you mean there are many communities, particularly in Wester Ross, where... It's, it's very difficult to understand um, for many of the citizens there what the actual benefit is. There have been a lot of challenges. So, and I also just would point out, I'm sure you'll be alert to the fact that regardless of the mode of propulsion, um, whether it's electric or whatever, you still get congestion. So just an assurance that you're alert to all the downsides of the heavily promoted NC500. <coughs> You can give a very brief answer because I'm not sure the NC500 is specifically in the uh, Enterprise Bill, but you can give a brief answer if you wish. Well, very, very briefly, yes. We, we have done an analysis of, of um, you know, what we can do better uh, and what we can learn from. Um, right, and uh, sorry, I'm just trying to think of the answer to that one is Richard Lyle um, and yeah, your question. Yeah, I thought that was a constituency question, but anyway. I, I, I thought it was, <laughs> and I, I did just think a, it was. Just and a I joke from la a couple of weeks ago. Which is why, Richard, I was very thankful that Malcolm didn't say that there was a way that he could do the North Coast 500 better in the South of Scotland. So, uh, Richard, your question. Yes, can we turn to the fact that the Bill makes provision for the Scottish Government to appoint a chair and members of the South of Scotland uh, Enterprise Board. Does it specify what skills and experiences are required of them? In your experience, uh, in my experience, I find that every, everybody wants to be on the board. I want to be on the board. Um, so, in your experience, who would you suggest should be on the board? Small business, family-run enterprise, third sector? trade unions, young people, or other representatives, and what are your experiences of your board? Um, that looks like that's almost a question for everyone, but we could repeat ourselves. So, so let's just start briefly at Steve and then work down the line some of the people you think should be on the board. Um, thank you. Um, it's clearly a matter for ministers, and, 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 and they have all the experience um, around that. So, so I, I won't speak to um, what I think the South should be made up of. My, my own experience of, of boards that I've worked uh, with and under and on is that they are um, diverse, 
um, that they are balanced, um, that, they, uh, that they understand what the organisation needs of them, not necessarily what the skill set they bring to it. So for me, and, and, and very quickly forming teams, cohesive teams, to deal with often complex uh, and, and, and challenging issues that, 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 can, uh, uh, that can sometimes face opposite ways. So for me, diversity and balance uh, uh, of what, across all, that, uh, all those things uh, is a good thing. Douglas. Broad range of skills, knowledge, experience, um, a knowledge of the area, um, and I guess an overall balance in terms of diversity and qualities on the board, rather than naming individuals. Thank you. Chris? Yes, I echo uh, Steve's initial comment about that this is ultimately a matter for ministers. I, I would look to the experience of the SOSEP board that's been formed um, over, you know, for the period between the announcement of the agency and the establishment of the agency. That's got a mix of public sector partners and critically private sector partners. It's got people of and from the area who knows the area. And I think one of the interesting things that, that Russell Griggs has tried to do has been about the reach out of that board to groups and communities who wouldn't norm normally find themselves around those tables. So, you know, in, in SDS, one of the things we've done is establish a youth board. And I think in finding a way in which the voice of young people uh, can be heard around the agency, I think, is going to be quite important going forward. Malcolm, do you have any? Yeah, the only thing, I, I totally agree with everything that's been said there. The, to me, one, once the direction's been set, I think you can then look at the skill set that's required to, to assist the, the executive team, however that looks, um, in delivering the strategy and, and the policy around that. Michael? I mean, we've rather run out of things by now, convener, I think, but... Um, I suppose I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, it is clearly a matter for Scottish ministers. I agree with, uh, with the previous uh, the characteristics colleagues have defined. Two, those I'd add, understanding that big picture, understanding the strategic objective of the, uh, of the board, and being committed to the mission. I think that commitment's an important fact, uh, and that's a feature of our own board. Okay, sorry. Can I ju just clarify? I mean, because as far as the committee is concerned, I know Richard probably push you a little bit further on this. It, it, it's not so much whether what uh, business or what part of the sector of business that they represent, it, you think it's more important that they come with the right skills and the knowledge of the area rather than specifically from the third sector or trade unions it, it, or, or, or small businesses or whatever. You think it's the skills they can bring to the board that is more important and previous knowledge? You're all nodding. Well, I, I think with the exception that you need a broad mix. Yes, okay. Thank you. Sorry, but Richard. Sorry, I didn't know. You basically need some, you know, you need people who know what they're doing and, and actually are interested in the area and interested in driving the, 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 the thing forward. My next question, and with the greatest respect to the question that was asked to Steve Dunlop er, earlier, putting the blame on uh, Scottish Enterprise, we also have to remember that there are councils in, in Scotland who do a lot of business. Uh, and, and work with businesses and whatnot. So my next qu question is, given that Business Gateway provides support to new and existing businesses, given that councils um, uh, deal with businesses, given that Skills Development Scotland deals with businesses, how can we ensure that business support landscape doesn't become cluttered with this new enterprise, that it's solely them who are driving businesses forward, maybe adding you guys in to help, but basically, so we don't, it's no cluttered and there's no duplication. How do we avoid that? Avoid that? Um, Steve, do you want to go? And I expect Douglas will have some comments from HIE's experience as well. Yes. I, yes, thank you. Um, for the last couple of years, there has been a strategic board that has brought together the family of agencies who focus on this. And that's been Scottish Enterprise, High, the Emerging South of Scotland Partnership as it's currently uh, set up, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. And that has singularly been about driving that interrelationship, that cohesion about us not being separate organisations, but actually becoming a system. And I have to say I'm very confident that we've made big strides in that, uh, in that direction and we will continue to make greater strides. Um, 
Through that approach, we have agreed that one of the major priorities is to involve and engage and manage that interface with local authorities, particularly through uh, Bus Business Gateway. And that's why I spoke earlier about the creation of a single-stop digital platform that we will share with, with all of those partners. So I'm extremely confident that what you'll see is a less cluttered landscape. I, was, I, I absolutely expect that the, the handoffs and the, and the sharing uh, of resource will be, should be invisible to the customer. People should just simply see the system and wherever they come into it, they should get excellent service. And we are all committed to delivering that. Um, and therefore, and, and in many ways, the south of Scotland is a kind of new, fresh ground where we can actually begin to model new economic development uh, um, approaches. We should be comfortable to take risks and for us to look at that area as a pioneering area that we can all learn from. Before we move on to other people, I've got you here, Mr Dunlop. One of the concerns I have is that this new agency won't have the same powers as uh, the Highland, sorry, maybe it should be Douglas Crown, I should be asking this question, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it to both of you, but... Uh, Ri sorry. Richard, Richard. Am I straying into somebody else's You question? are indeed. I don't know, there's a sort of festive spirit for yeah, taking everyone be. else's I, I uh, that, uh, questions. So sorry, could, I, I'm going to stop you there and I'm going to let Douglas answer the question and I'll let Peter ask his question in due course. Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I pretty much agree with Steve. That's what the work of the um, Enterprise and Skills Review and the Board is, is trying to do, is streamline um, access to services and make that all work um, uh, better. Uh, an observation, maybe, from, from my perspective, I think the relationship with Business Gateway works best when there is co-location going on, and I see that that's one of the principles of the new South of Scotland um, agency, so I would support that. I think that, that is a way to help things work smoothly. Uh I'm happy to let anyone else in, but you were all nodding, so it seemed like the, the, you agreed, unless there's anything you want to add to, specifically to that. Chris, do you want to add something specifically? Rather than repeat what Stephen Douglas um, have just said, which I, I completely agree with, I'll offer two kind of specific examples where we're trying to declutter the landscape. The first is um, we, we've just agreed with Scottish Enterprise that we'll operate a shared CRM system um, for the first time across both agencies, and we expect that that's something that um, the South of Scotland Agency will be interested in in time. The second is, and I'm going to get into trouble for mentioning the B words, but over the last six months we've been uh, working uh, across Scottish Enterprise High, the Funding Council, Visit Scotland, to develop a Prepare for Brexit campaign. Uh, that was launched six weeks ago and it's, um, it draws together the respective kind of expertise and knowledge of the agencies into one single portal and that's got to be uh, the way forward, I think. Okay. Um, I am now going to move on to the next question, which will give Peter the chance to ask his questions. Peter. Well, I've got a couple, but following on from Richard, I mean, I, I, still, um, I still remain to be convinced that what the, of, of, of what the new body can actually give to the area. You know, that given that many of the, 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 the bodies that are represented here will still remain, uh, representing the South, and given that the core aims of the new body are really nothing new, it's about supporting inclusive economic growth, providing, maintaining and safeguarding employment, enhancing skills, etc., etc. Is there a danger that we're just inventing a new body for the sake of it, which will just replicate what's already there? Michael, you looked so you wanted to come straight back at that. Uh, well, yes. Um, may I? I think um, one of the things that struck me is the... Um, momentum that Russell Griggs and Rob Dixon have lent to this agenda. Um, they've convened the right stakeholders around one table and they've developed a clear focus on accelerating growth in the south, south of Scotland. Um, from the Funding Council's perspective, as I've said earlier, we've devoted a member of staff to um, tackling the, uh, the two colleges as really operators in one region. Um, We've also seen recently a new articulation agreement, to use the technical term, between um, Dumfries and Galloway College and Glasgow School of Art. Now, these things may have happened in time, but I think the creation of the new agency has lent that focus that accelerated that progress. So I'm quite optimistic about, actually, its, um, its prospects. Does anyone else want to... Anyone else want to comment on that? Steve, I'm surprised you're not... I think the challenge, I mean, for, for me, um, I'm really interested, again, if we 
think horizontally across all these agencies. How do these agencies, you know, work in a much more seamless and integrated and joined up way? And I think we have begun that journey. But that system has to be applied uh, at a local, regional and national level. And I think what you're seeing here is that focus being brought to some of these fundamental challenges that we've spoke about earlier. So I, I think this capacity that is being brought in, brought when focused in that area will make a difference. So, and, and it's not about cluttering, it's not about substitution, I think it can add value. But it is important they will work cohesively and that these handoffs, again, when we are presenting the South to the international market, that, that I think, again, I think we can add a lot of value in a lot of layers, but we do need to be careful that we don't trip over each other. Peter. Okay, we'll leave that there. I mean, the committee is, we've also heard that the new agency will, will not be given certain powers that the SE and H, NHIE already have, such as the powers of compulsory purchase, uh, uh, information requests. You know, I wonder, if, has either Scottish Enterprise or the Highlands and Islands Enterprise ever used these powers? And is there any concern that the new agency will be disadvantaged because they don't have these specific powers? Okay, that's Stephen Douglas specifically. Yeah. Steve, do you want yeah. to go first and then Douglas? Yes. Um, um, we have CPO powers, and in the, all the years that we've been a body, we've never used them once. Um, I'm not sure whether we've threatened to use them. Quite often that, that actually is the stimulus, but we, have, we haven't used them. Our um, approach, and there's a, uh, an issue at the moment, um, where we, through partnership with the local authority, we will harness their capability, because they have expertise, they utilise it regularly, it's a very complicated process, the new planning act will have an impact on all of that. So for me, if this is a genuine partnership here and local authorities are part of that, then utilise the skills that the partnership has and, and therefore the, the, the CPO power, for example, rests within the local authority. So I don't see it as an impediment. We have it but we've never used it. Uh, similarly, we've had it and never used it. Um, we have considered it on a couple of occasions in the past, but managed to navigate, negotiate our way through. So these powers have never been used. And, and I absolutely agree with Steve. Um, um, the 97 Planning Act introduced specific CPO powers. Um, communities have got uh, greater powers to acquire land. Um, we're working more collaboratively with partners. Um, I, I don't see it inhibiting the work of the, the new agency. I just, just a wee follow. I just, I just wonder that if the fact that you, you, you have these powers in your back pocket, if, if you like, might focus minds. You've never used them, but the, the threat that you might use them, does that, did that, you know, did that come into play on occasion? Steve, you, you can answer that, but I mean, it would be helpful to understand is, is that the CPO powers are a replication, are they not, of what's in the planning legislation already? So if you, you could surely go, just go to local government and ask them to CPO it on your behalf, is, is that right? T typically that's what you would do, and very often, and I suspect that the, the, if, you've, if you see that the land is an economic inhibitor, someone's holding it and it's a barrier to growth, then you would be doing that, I would imagine, in partnership. You would have that shared vision, that shared approach with the local authority, and therefore the local authority would be motivated you know, to support that. And, that. and at the end of the day, if we are moving towards a much more collaborative uh, space and we don't want to clutter and we don't want to duplicate, then use uh, that tool that's already in the system. Do you want to add to that? Or? I, don't okay. I agree, absolutely. OK, perfect. I think we'll leave that there. Colin, you've got the, the next sequence. Can I just follow up on that, that, that final point? Um, it has been um, mentioned that the Highlands and Islands legislation is obviously a lot more detailed in terms of the powers of, of the Highlands and Islands Agency compared to the South of Scotland Agency. Uh, and the argument has been that um, in the past, the very detailed powers and aims of the Highlands and Islands Agency has meant you've not been able to do things that you would like to have done. That was certainly the response from government officials when we asked why the South of Scotland bill was so general and not as detailed and specific as the Highlands and Islands legislation, because they wanted to give the South of Scotland Agency more flexibility, and potentially the Highlands and Islands Agency have not been able to do something because the legislation that's set up is very specific. Can you think of any example in which the agency in the Highlands and Islands has not been able to do something because of the legislation and the powers that you have set out in the bill? Yeah, good Douglas, very briefly. It, no, I, I don't think I can. Um, I, the powers are detailed, but they remain broad. Um, 
and I think we can do very broad powers to do anything that for the general economic and social development of the region. There are a number of specifics mentioned in the Act, but, but these aren't exclusive. I think the powers remain broad. I guess if there was one area that, that um, maybe it can be, well, it's not a major inhibitor, but it, it can get in the way sometimes is almost the restriction in our, our ability to work uh, beyond the boundaries of the Highlands and Islands. So um, we do de deliver a couple of things nationally and we need to go through specific arrangements to enable us to do that. Scottish Land Fund being one uh, obvious example. It's been mentioned, one of the decisions that government ministers will have to do is, is where the new agency will be physically based. But I, I get the impression from what's been mentioned so far, the issue of co-location is important, that um, organisations should be co-located and there shouldn't necessarily be a single headquarters in the south of Scotland. Is that a view that the, the agency shares, uh, the, 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 the panel shares? And more widely, the bill at the moment is very silent on how this will work in practical terms, but you all represent agencies that work in the south of Scotland at the moment. This is an, another agency that will be working in the south of Scotland. What practical measures need to be delivered to make sure there isn't duplication, but probably more importantly, that there aren't gaps as a result of all the agencies working together? What practical measures do we need to make sure happen to avoid that, that those gaps? Um, a massive question there, I think several. Um, Co-location, who'd like to, to start on that? Malcolm, do you want to get on that? I think co-location is actually important. I mean, I'm sure there'll, there'll be somewhere with a nameplate on it, which is the designated registered office. But um, it, 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 the one thing that's come through, and, and, and it's been said before, the ownership or sense of ownership in the South at the moment of this new agency is actually quite strong. So to build on that, I think people are, are going to have to see it and, and feel it, and, and it's got to be a tangible part of their lives. Uh, to keep that, that momentum going. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is then through co-location to make sure that you know there are, there are people across the region, not just based in one, one place. Uh, and, and I think that that is the ambition of the, the SOSEP board, is that, that, that we will look at how we can all work together. And just to, to come to how do you avoid duplication, Quite clearly, there needs to be business planning where we can all get together, where we can look at, we're all contributing. Because this really, to, to make the difference that, that's required, is going to be about the sum of the parts. And you can only maximise that if you're actually working together and not against each other. OK, uh, Steve. Um, yeah, I, I would like Malcolm's part there. Each year we get a a letter of guide, strategic guidance from our minister, and, and those are now, I expect, will begin to look very similar across each of the agencies, directing us towards those shared ambitions. And I think our corporate plans and our business operating plans over time will begin uh, uh, to absolutely major on where, where those points of alignment uh, are. So I think there'll be much more visibility of that collaboration that the strategic board is, is trying to drive. So I think that's a place where you will see uh, that commonality, that share of resources, that share of, share of intent um, in, in that letter of, 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 of uh, uh, letter of guidance each year is what we will be collectively held to account uh, by Parliament. Um, I absolutely agree with the, the, the co-location. I think it works best with integrated teams, but clearly, you know, part of this issue, uh, this issue is the rurality and how do you disperse those assets that make the agency uh, and all of us very accessible to all the people of the South. So um, I think there will be an HQ, but for me, um, the assets will need to be distributed. Chris, you want to come in? Steve's just made the point that some of the points I was just about to make there, so I'll, no, not at all, not at all. Um, it, just in terms of the, the principle of um, the agency location, it's, it's ultimately a matter for the agency, but I, I would echo, I think co-location is really important for, for three reasons, from a financial perspective, for getting people to work together, and, and also um, to, to address kind of rurality. We're already working, and we, we've got co-location arrangements in place in the south of Scotland, right across Scotland. I think in relation to you know, the practical measures that we, we take to avoid tripping over each other. I wouldn't underestimate the strength of the work that's actually been undertaken at the moment through um, the South of Scotland Partnership, where you have got um, the agencies going through um, a work planning exercise, which is looking at where we fit together and critically where we think our offer will be going into the agency. And I think that principle of kind of collaboration going forward is going to be absolutely critical. It will change over time. 
Um, and I think where we start is not where we're going to end up. But um, like Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty um, enthusiastic and actually hopeful uh, in terms of what the next few years brings. Colin, I'll allow you one more question. Can, can I just come back on, on the issue of accountability, though, that all, you, all the agencies you represent are accountable to government ministers, ultimately. And one of the, one of the questions that people in the south of Scotland are asking, how is this agency going to be accountable to the people of the south of Scotland? How are you actually going to make sure what you're delivering is what is in line, or the new agency is delivering what is in line with what the people in the south of Scotland want, not necessarily what government ministers direct you to do. So how will you do that? Because uh, touching on the work of the uh, of SOSEP at the moment, one of the criticisms that's, that's, that's coming from stakeholders at the moment is that there are lots of agencies working together and talking with each other, but actually are you talking to the wider community around small businesses? You know, Ask a member of the public how you would track down a copy of the minutes of the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. And, and frankly, you'd have to be Sherlock Holmes to track that down. There isn't the information there to notify people in the South of Scotland of the work of of the new economic partnership and that's a concern going forward to the new agency so how do you make sure the new agency is fully transparent and more importantly is accountable to the people of the south of scotland and not just uh, in, in the form of direction from from from, from, from government um colin your questions seem to be getting longer <laughs> who would like to 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 answer answer that uh, douglas do you want to start off yeah, okay, one of the key um, elements is, I think, that broad visibility and presence across the whole region. I think, uh, from High's experience, we find that quite important. We've got eight area teams dotted about, um, covering the patch, um, with fairly, degree, fairly high degrees of delegated authority to flex regional policy to reflect local circumstances. Um, a key part of the role of these teams is to engage with the businesses and communities within their patch to understand uh, what these issues are um, locally, to reflect what they do, but to feed into um, the agency. Also really important is the role of the board in this, uh, and High's board also gets around the patch and engages with businesses and communities uh, through its regular cycle of board meetings. So it's a, it's a key part of what we do, and I would suggest if not replicating similar types of models to deliver similar types of things in the South would be really important. Steve? I don't think I've got anything to add to that. I think the, the new board is going to be key, the visibility. Um, and I think ministers will be taking the temperature of what do businesses think and what do communities think of this. Um, so, so, and I think that will be a key measure of the support that the new agency gets. I think that this is has already started a bit, you know, it feels to me that it is very engaged and, 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 and I think it will want to maintain that. I think the issue of transparency, if that's not transparent now, I think, um, I think uh, someone needs to take that away and make sure that that work is very transparent. But can I widen that out a bit? Just, uh, do, you, do you think the development of a strategic plan uh, for, for the body, which, which is laid before Parliament so everyone can see what's going on, would be a useful a uh, document which would add to the transparency. Um, who, would anyone like to comment on that? Oh. Yep, Michael. I, I mean, I think transparency in, in, in an agency's strategic plan is, is a good thing. Um, now, I think all members of the, um, of the South, South of Scotland Executive Partnership were impressed by the way that Russell Griggs and Rob Dixon Went around, um, went around the region, I think 26, 30 odd sessions in town halls and village halls across the region in order to engage with local people, with local communities to hear what they thought. And they brought that back to the executive partnership as the basis for thinking about the strategic plan. So I think we can be confident that the current leadership of SOSET is actually absolutely seized of the notion of transparency and we want to take that into its um, formal planning once it attains full agency status. Okay. Does anyone else want to add to that? Okay, well, I think that brings us uh, to the end of our evidence session. I'd like to thank you all for, for coming and for the evidence that you've given. I'm now going to briefly suspend the me meeting for five minutes uh, to allow the witnesses to depart. The meeting is therefore suspended. Thank you.
Welcome back uh, to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I'd like to move to agenda item two, which is the European Union Withdrawal Act notifications. There are notifications on the aquatic animal health and plant health. There's one SI, and there are two SIs on plant breeding and propagating. Uh, these cover uh, the areas that I've said, and all the instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Withdrawal Act. The two proposed SI on plant breeding and propagating have been categorised by the Scottish Government in general as Category A, making minor or technical amendments. The SI on aquatic animal and plant health is categorised as Category B, to the extent that it be a transition from a UK, uh, sorry, EU to a UK framework would be a major and significant development. Are there any comments? John, you'd like to make a comment. Um, thank you very much, Convener. I, I have no issue, and indeed I know there's proposals that we seek further information, and I would be very supp supportive of that. I think um, th th these are some of the latest, and we've no, we've no doubt we've got more coming of very important issues. It was one particular aspect I wanted to, to focus on, and that is um, a reference in our papers to um, there being an established functioning joint legal framework. And indeed, it goes on to talk about a paragraph 14 um, saying, uh, and I quote here, provisions for the ministers to act jointly, and this forms the basis of governance framework. I think, given the nature of what we're dealing with, it's absolutely vital that there, that uh, cooperation continues. The very nature of, of the issues um, lend itself to that. But could, I get, uh, could we also get clarification when we're right that that is a robust framework because, um, and that will, that framework will be honoured because certainly some of what's happened in this process thus far has not been fully courteous to the devolved administrations. And I would like just an assurance that previous arrangements, which presumably have worked satisfactorily or would have heard to the contrary, will continue. Okay. Does anyone else have any comments? So I, I think that the, the papers and, and uh, suggested that we write to the Scottish Government to confirm its content for the consent to the UK SI as referred to in the notification and note a request uh, on a wider policy uh, matters um, as we've identified in the papers and to make that comment and question that, that John Finney's raised about uh, the process. Is, is that agreed? Okay, that is agreed. Just therefore, before we move into private session, I would just like to note on the official record that one of uh, the clerks from the committee is leaving the parliament, having had seven years of service and worked very hard for the committee. And I'd like to formally record our thanks to Heather uh, for all the work that she's done in the parliament. So thank you, Heather. And we will now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>